uh, the Barna Group, uh, re you know, a church research group, they recently did a study on how things have changed for Christians in terms of sharing their faith in the last 25 years. And of course, in every study that they do, what they found was staggering. One in four Christians have had 10 or more conversations about faith in the past year. Just one in four have had even just 10 conversations, one a month, just less than one month. Nearly half of Christians admit that they would avoid a spiritual conversation if it meant their friend would reject them. And even still, some even would say that, you know, technology has made it easier to share their faith, but the same amount of people would say, well, it's also hard because I'm really busy with technology. I'm really busy with my life. But this next slide really convicted me. In 1993, 89% of Christians agreed that every Christian has a responsibility to share their faith. But today, just 64% say so. A 25% drop in 25 years. That number should never go anywhere else but 100%. The Christians realize they must share their faith. And yet we know as Christians that more and more people are starting to claim to be atheists, agnostics, religiously unaffiliated, or even just say, I don't believe in anything at all because it doesn't matter. They don't want to put themselves into a category. And so Tim Keller, a pastor from, a former pastor from New York who's you know, written a ton of books, this is what he had to say when he looked at this study. He said, so at a moment when there is more need for evangelism, meaning sharing the good news about Jesus, there is less willingness to do it. And so why aren't we being more public? Well, Tim Keller lists three reasons. First of all, talking about faith is more complicated. It takes more explaining of the basics, and so many more people now don't even know the basics of our faith. And I think this is especially true in a city like Portland, who, of people who just have no desire to be a part of any sort of religious system, so they don't know the basics. So we can't assume when we have conversations with people, they'll just know what we're talking about. So it makes it more complicated. It's also more difficult because in many ways, people don't believe that Christianity actually is good for the world. That's a scary thought to think of, that people might think that Christianity doesn't accomplish good, which is why we do things like service projects, why we do things like mission trips so we can accomplish good for the world. But then it's also less welcome. This is the third reason from Keller. No one, this, you might have heard this phrase at some point in your life from somebody you were trying to tell about Jesus. They would say, no one has the right to tell others what to believe, so you shouldn't be trying to convert anyone. You might have heard that phrase at some point. And so however you slice this, sharing our faith takes more work than it did 25 years ago and will continue to be so the more that our culture seems to wants to separate itself from anything religious. And I think even with the advent of technology, now we want things to be easier. So now that things are getting more difficult, we will be more tempted to resist and to try and not do something that is difficult. But the need is obvious. Jesus has made it very very clear that our mission and our call is to go and share the gospel with those who are lost, even if it means we're going to be ridiculed, even if it means we're going to be criticized, even if it means we're going to be rejected. This is what we are supposed to do. And so what, what, what can happen is sometimes we can become caught up in the wrong mission. We can prioritize the wrong things in our lives. And so we forget and ignore sometimes even the, the mission that Jesus has for us. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And that our radical mission as followers of Christ is to make disciples of all nations. And we are empowered by God's spirit to accomplish it. So now I invite you to turn to the book of Acts, verses 1 through 11, chapters 1 through 11, and our verse, chapter 1, 1 through 11, okay, a little slip of the tongue there, and turn to page 1090 if you need one of the hardcover backs in the seat in front of you. But I want to make sure to clarify a couple things before we move forward. First of all, in the book of Acts. And this is a book that is about the continuation of Jesus' work through the Holy Spirit in the early church. How the apostles, how the early church people continued the work that Jesus began. And so it's written by this man named Luke, and we, and we call him Luke the physician. He was likely a doctor. And what he did is he compiled eyewitness testimonies to kind of figure out, to, to show this is Jesus. This is who he is. He is the Messiah. He is God's own son. He has come to save the world. And he pulled this all together. But then he has a second work that was connected to the first one called the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is about how it continues, how the, the apostles continued what Jesus was doing. 
And so the following two weeks after today, we'll also be in the book of Acts. But we have to ask ourselves the question, because today we're talking about the radical mission. So what do I mean by mission? Well, look at Matthew 28, 18 through 20. This will be on the screen. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So this is what we would call the Great Commission. This is this commissioning statement by Jesus for his apostles. This is what they were supposed to do, and it's very clear what it says. Go and make disciples. Go. Go out and do it. Uh, one of my new favorite authors in the last couple years, his name is David Platt. He wrote a book called Radical, and I highly, highly recommend this book. This is what he has to say about this Great Commission. Disciple making is not a call for others to come to us to hear the gospel, but a command for us to go to others to share the gospel. You see, we have mission fields throughout the world, at home and abroad, that we can go and share the gospel. And so we need, that's what we need to be doing. That is our mission. That is our call to go. Not expect people to come to us, but to go out into the world and share this message. But then we have to ask the question, okay, so what is a disciple? What does that even mean? Well, this other book that also has shaped my thoughts on some of these issues, this is uh, this book called Disciple Shift, kind of a nice little play on words there. This is what it says. Disciples are not merely converts, but also doers, learners, students, Christ followers, or better yet, I love this term, apprentices of Jesus. That we would view ourselves as I am Jesus' apprentice. I follow him. I do what he teaches me me to do. And so this is kind of the foundation that will lead us into what we're going to talk about for the rest of the morning in the book of Acts. So let's go ahead and begin. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So remember, the former book, that's the Gospel of Luke, and it shows what Jesus, as he says here, began to do and teach. And he writes to this character, this person named Theophilus. It's like likely that it's not a specific person. This, the word, the name means dear to God. There were people named Theophilus at this time, but what it seems more likely that, that Luke is doing here is he's kind of picking out a representative figure that represented the intelligent middle class in Rome, and he was trying, and Luke was trying to convince this person of a, and these people, of a more favorable opinion of Christianity, because it wasn't super favorable at that time. And so notice how Luke, what Luke says here. He says what Jesus began to do and teach. What's kind of implied here is that Jesus began it and now the apostles are supposed to continue that mission. And the beautiful thing, I love this. This is, this is the beautiful thing about the Greek language. There's a Greek particle, this little word in here that goes in between where it says to do, then it uses the word te, and then the word and, kai is what that word is, and then to teach. When that word, little word te is thrown in there, it basically says these two things that are separated here are inextricably, inextricably connected. They are the same, that you cannot separate them. So what Jesus did and what Jesus taught, they have to work hand in hand. And so doing, and it goes for us too, doing the good works of the kingdom, serving the poor, feeding the hungry, those kinds of things go along with sharing the truth of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That we can't separate the two, that we need both of those in order to do the work of the gospel. And so again, the doing is about his work of the kingdom that Jesus, that Jesus did, and his teaching is about how it is only by grace alone through faith in Jesus that a person can be saved, and that when a person places their faith in Christ, they are radically transformed to become a new person who is enabled by the Holy Spirit living in them to obey Jesus and to continue his mission of bringing his kingdom to the world. And so this is what Jesus did, this is what he taught, and he did this up until the day he was taken to heaven, his ascension, that's what that means, and we'll talk about that at the end of the passage we're studying this morning. But then he gives them instructions through the Holy Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit was giving the instructions to Jesus to give to the apostles, but as well, they're also, as we'll learn later, dependent on that spirit, but we'll look at that in a little bit. 
But these apostles, it changes here because it's been, they've been referred to the disciples up to this point, and so now they're being called apostles. What an apostle is, is someone, look at this definition, I love it, commissioned, sent, an agent, a messenger, envoy, delegate. This is someone who is sent as a missionary, someone who is sent out, who has a mission to accomplish. And so Jesus gives these apostles his commands. And, it's a, and instead of the word instructions, it's more commands. It's more like he's giving them his, their marching orders, their, their mission that they are now supposed to lead. They are to preach the good news of the gospel, that God has provided a way for men to be made right with God through the cross of Christ. And that they are to accomplish this mission, as it says, through the Holy Spirit. And again, we'll talk about that when we get to verse 5. But after, it says in verse 3, after his suffering, Jesus appeared appeared to them. He would present himself. And so this is kind of an interesting thing. After Jesus rose from the dead, it says he appeared to them over a period of 40 days. And it wasn't like he appeared and then he stayed with them for 40 years. It'd almost be like, and this could be somewhat comical to think about, that Jesus would just randomly appear at one point and then he'd disappear again. So the disciples would be sitting there and the apostles would not know. And then, oh, there's Jesus. Okay, we're doing this. We're doing this kingdom talking now. Okay, here we go. We're back into it. And then he would disappear. Okay? And so this is what he would do over these 40 days, and then he would be speaking about the kingdom of God, but he's also doing these convincing proofs, as we'll see in a minute, that he was alive, that this wasn't just some phantom ghost thing, but he's then speaking about this kingdom of God. And what, he, what it means here is it refers to God's promised rule that comes with Jesus' messianic program and activity, that Jesus took on all our sin upon himself on the cross, dying the death on our behalf that we deserved, and rose from the dead three days later, showing that his sin was enough to pay the penalty of our sins, so that if we believe in him and his work alone for our salvation, that we will be saved. But the important thing to be a part of this kingdom and what this kingdom is, is that we must confess our sins and turn away from our sin and turn towards God, turn towards Jesus and allow for him to radically change us. And so this is why I think the apostles are very adamant about this time where Jesus is speaking to them. I think what he's doing is he's being a little bit more clear during this time. You know, during Jesus' earthly ministry, he's telling these parables, he's telling these stories, and sometimes the disciples are sitting there going, I have no idea what he's talking about. I think during this season, Jesus is being extremely clear and he's laying it out for them. This is what you're going to do and this is what you need to teach, which is why a lot of the New Testament is written to basically clarify and make sure that the church is understood and that the apostles had the authority because they were given these things by the actual source of this information. But there's something really important here we need to understand from this part of the story is that we have a God who is alive. He is not dead. It is a beautiful truth. And that Paul makes it very clear. The Apostle Paul makes this clear in, in 1 Corinthians 15. That if Christ did not resurrect from the dead, then our faith is in vain. Our faith is pointless. Doing what we're doing here this morning would be pointless if Jesus did not raise from the dead. And as well, this mission would also be pointless. And so this is our first objective that we continue the mission that Jesus began. What I think has unfortunately happened within a, a lot of areas of American Christianity is that we have so twisted the teachings of Jesus to be about us, to be about our comfort, to try and find self-help, to make us feel better about ourselves and receiving things that we might want rather than what the mission of Jesus truly is. And I think we have forgotten it. Many times we forget it. Jesus didn't die so that we would be comfortable in this life, but that we would be raised from the from dead in our sin and be brought to new life in him so that we can live for him, to live on mission for him in this world. So we always have to be asking ourselves the question, how are we going to lay aside our old lives and take up the new life in Jesus? Because our marching orders are extremely clear. Go and make disciples. So you might say, okay, I see that that's our call. That's what we're supposed to do. But I, I, I don't even know where to begin. How do I do it? Well, if you know somebody in this church, you know somebody in your life that's doing it, that's out there making disciples, come to them and say, will you disciple me, please? Show me what this looks like. Show me what this means. I want to learn how to do it because we can't learn how to do something we know nothing about. So take a moment and say, I got to find somebody to disciple me so I can join in on this mission. But then some might even say, okay, Chris, I that looks great for the apostles, but how do we know this is truly for everyone? Because look at what Jesus said. 
He says, teaching them, the disciples that they're going to make, to obey everything I have commanded you, which implies, in, includes making disciples. So we are all, this is on every single one of us. We might do this with different gifts. We might contribute in different ways, how God has wired us. We might be called to stay home. We might be called to go abroad, to go overseas. But no matter what, this mission is on all of us. Nobody is exempt or given a free pass from this mission. So you have to ask, in what ways can you contribute in your current life stage? Who is in your sphere of influence that you could be telling them about Jesus so that they can join in on this mission as well? Let's continue verse 4. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So on one of these occasions where Jesus has been sharing, you know, talking about the kingdom, talking about it probably more plainly, and he's appeared to them, this is one thing that he actually said. And so again, he does this, he eats with them to kind of show them, hey, I'm not just some phantom, ethereal, ghost-like creature floating around the world. I, am a re I have a real body. I'm a real person here who has risen from the dead. And so he's doing this and he's showing them, but he tells them this command. And it's kind of an interesting one. Don't leave Jerusalem and instead wait for the gift the Father has promised. So in other words, don't start on the mission of the kingdom until uh, you receive this gift. And this gift, well, it's implied from verse 5. This is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Throughout the books of Luke and John, Jesus promised that a helper would come. And it was necessary for this helper to come. And that Jesus, it was necessary for Jesus to leave so that this helper would then come. And this helper was the Holy Spirit, God's own spirit coming to dwell in his people. And you've got to understand from the perspective of Jesus' apostles that when they would hear this phrase, that this would, be, this would be outside their minds. This would be so crazy. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would simply, would truly rush upon people for specific moments of ministry. Or it would enable them to speak God's words. Or, it would, or the Holy Spirit would fill the temple to indicate God's presence with the nation of Israel. And so now, this same Spirit that breathed out stars, that breathed, out, that breathed life into humans, that spoke the very words of God, that created the baby Jesus in Mary's womb, that raised Jesus from the dead, will now live in every person who puts their faith in Christ alone. That should be exciting. But you've got to understand the personal nature of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's not an it. He's a he, because he is God, and he is God come to dwell in us. And so he will now come as God has promised, and Jesus had, had spoken about this with his disciples numerous times. And so he explains it this way. He says, John baptized with water. And he's talking about John the Baptist, and before Jesus' ministry began, John the Baptist was baptizing people in water in order to prepare them for the coming of the Messiah, to, to prepare for this opportunity for repentance. And so the word baptism literally means being dunked into water, being immersed into water. <laughs> And so what, what Jesus is actually telling them is you are going to be baptized. You are going to be dunked and immersed with the Holy Spirit. This is an amazing idea. Crazy idea, especially for those of Jesus' apostles and people in that day. So truly, if you've ever wondered what your purpose is in life and how you're going to go about doing it, I'm going to give you your answer. It's right here. Go and make disciples of all nations. And God himself will enable you to do it by dwelling within your heart. This should be absolutely exciting news. That God has given you a mission to accomplish, but he has also given you the ability to do it through his own Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful idea. But I love this truth as well, that the Spirit enables effective service in the kingdom. You want to be effective? You have the Holy Spirit already within you, living within you. Again, David Platt says something absolutely brilliant about this. I love this. The good news of Jesus spread not just through gifted preachers, but through everyday people whose lives had been transformed by the power of Christ. So here's, here's what you've got to do. You've got to look through the pages of the Bible, and you've got to see that these are absolutely normal human beings. You've got Moses, who was a murderer and also who did not want to talk in public. 
You have Jeremiah, who probably needed to go see a counselor and get some Xanax or something, because that guy was having some hard times. Okay? You have David, who was this unimpressive person, but he could sling a rock pretty well. You have all these people that are normal, everyday people, and God used them for absolutely incredible things. These were also broken people. These were also sinful people. So if God can use those kinds of people to further his kingdom, he can do the same thing with us. He absolutely can. And the, the problem normally is, is that we have a trouble believing that he can. Do you believe it? I want you to. And so here's our second objective is that we rely on God's Holy Spirit to accomplish the mission. I think many of the problems we have in pursuing the mission of Jesus is that we try to rely on our abilities and our methods, our philosophies to accomplish the mission. But I want you to think of this like an electronic appliance. Think of it like this. If you don't plug in that appliance into a source of electricity, it's truly just going to sit there, do nothing, and not be effective at all. In order for that thing to actually work, you got to plug it in. Same thing. If you do not plug yourself into God's spirit, if you don't rely on his source of strength to give you what you need to do it and trust in him to enable you to accomplish the mission he has put in front of you, you will simply do nothing and not be an effective tool. Sure, you might be an oppressive-looking appliance at some point. You might also have these grandiose statements of, well, I'm going to do all this. I plan on doing all those things. But if you don't lean into God, if you don't plug into the source, he will not be effective the way that you need to be. And keep in mind, this plugging in is not just a one-time thing. It's not like, okay, I believe in Jesus. Cool, I'm good for the rest of my life. I don't need to talk to him again. I can do this. This is a continual, constant thing that you need to do. Constantly plugging in. So my piece of advice here is don't just gloss over the Bible when it takes, when you're going in to study it. Take time to have it, in fact, do the reverse. Have it study you. Basically, use it like a mirror to reflect back to you how you are still fallen, how you are still broken, how you are still in need of God's grace, but that God's grace has been given to you, that God's grace has been offered to you, and God's spirit has been put into your heart so that he will enable you to accomplish this mission right in front of you. We have been washed totally clean of all of our sins so that we can be free to serve him. So we have to think of what ways have we depended on our strength, our abilities, in order to accomplish the mission? And in what ways do we need to learn what it means to depend totally on God and his spirit to accomplish this mission? Let's continue verse 6. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So remember, the Jews at this time expected that this Messiah, the, the Messiah that Jesus was claiming to be, that he was going to be this coming, conquering king, this powerful figure who was going to take over the Romans. But instead, Jesus did not come to do that. But they also viewed the coming of the Messiah in this new kingdom that was going to be ushered in, that was talked about all throughout the Old Testament. They viewed this as one event. And what Jesus is basically saying here is, nope, you're wrong again. Two events. Coming of Messiah and then the eternal kingdom. And in between, you are going to be my witnesses throughout the world. This is what you are going to do. And so the disciples here have more of a concern about this nationalistic hope of Israel, that Israel's going to do something and be this great, grandiose kingdom. And for them, the idea that the Gentiles even would ever be a part of this was unheard of. This would be unprecedented. This would be crazy talk. And so that even though Jesus rose from the dead and continued to teach them about the kingdom, they still clearly did not understand that Jesus did not come to be this conquering king. And so to kind of give them a little bit of the benefit of the doubt, all of what Jesus would, has done up to this point would give them, would stir into their mind this possibility. But Jesus is basically saying, everything that you learned about that, that's not right. It's, it's going to be different. But I think we can make a very similar mistake about having, you know, like the disciples were doing, that they were looking for this national hope of Israel. I think we can do the same thing as American Christians, believing that in some way America is God's kingdom. 
you have to understand this. Don't get me wrong. I love this country. I love the freedom that has been afforded to us as followers of Christ because of the laws of this land. It's given us Christians unparalleled influence and freedom to operate in the history of the world. It is amazing. I'm very thankful for it every single day. But America is not God's kingdom, nor is any other earthly kingdom or political system that a human could create because a human created it, it would be fallen. The kingdom that we proclaim, the, the kingdom that we prioritize and devote ourselves to is the kingdom of the good news of God's grace in Christ that we have the opportunity to be saved. And so Jesus kind of rebuffs the question about whether he's going to restore the kingdom of Israel at this time. And what he basically says is, look, whatever plans God may have, had, may have for the nation of Israel in the future, that's not to be your concern. That's up to God. His messengers were not to be concerned with this, but instead on f to focus on proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. And I think the same thing applies for us as Christians in America. Whatever God has planned for America is not anywhere near as much of a concern for us as proclaiming the gospel is. So here's what we do. We trust in God's sovereignty. We, are thank we need to be thankful for the freedom that we experience here. We participate in elections. We vote. We pay our taxes. Okay, we can speak up about things that we see. We can participate as being good, law-abiding citizens. We pray for our leaders. We do all of those things. But our priority is that we want to see God's kingdom here. We don't stop proclaiming about Jesus. But as a result of what Jesus is saying here, none of us are ever going to know when Jesus is going to return. We can't know the exact date that that's going to happen. And anybody who tells you that is flat out wrong. They don't know. They can't know. Jesus makes it clear. And I think the reason that Jesus kind of doesn't say when he's going to return and, and tells it's not for you to know, so that it creates within us this urgency to say, okay, we've got a mission to accomplish and we need to go do it because we don't know when he's going to come back. We don't know when the time is going to be up. So let's get out there and let's get busy and let's get going because I think if we knew when Jesus was going to return, I think we might be a little bit more lax on, on pushing for that. So we don't know. So that means we need to be willing to go. So again, instead of being focused on political power, political things in this world, Jesus says, instead, you will receive power and the Holy Spirit comes on you. And so rather than the power of a uh, political power of a restored Israel, the power of the Holy Spirit will dwell in them as we talked about earlier, that the same power that resurrected Christ created the world, enabled Jesus to perform miracles, will now dwell in them and enable them to proclaim the gospel and it is available for every single one of us. But what is this power used for? It's not for selfish gain, not for political power, but is to be his witnesses around the world. And so because these disciples had seen Jesus, they could testify to the truth of what they were claiming about him. They were willing even to die for it. There's all kinds of accounts of what these men went through when they died, knowing and believing what they had taught and saying that this is not a lie. Jesus rose from the dead. He's real. This gospel message is true. They died for what they saw. And so then... We're given these kind of uh, spheres of influence, areas where we need to be reaching. And so here's what it starts with. First of all, it starts with your home, a media around you, the Jerusalem. What is your Jerusalem? What is around you? Where can you be reaching people that is right in your community? Judea and Samaria, the surrounding areas. But of course, what Jesus does when he includes Samaria, he's also including, hey, these are people you might not like and people that are you know, currently your enemies because the Jews did not like the Samaritans and vice versa, did not like each other. So you got to be reaching your enemies. You got to be reaching people you might not be comfortable with. But also he says to go to the ends of the earth, to go around the world, anywhere to reach people for Christ. And so this is our third objective, that the mission target is the whole world. And the beautiful thing is that the apostles did this. There are church legends about how far these guys traveled, and it's pretty amazing. There's great stories of the apostle Thomas, doubting Thomas, making it all the way out to India to share the gospel where he died. There's also a story of uh, Andrew, who got executed on an X. He got crucified on an X in Greece, and that that story itself reached its way to Scotland, and that's why they have St. Andrew's Cross. 
It's on an, it's an X. Look at the flag of Scotland. Paul made his way to Spain before he was brought back to Rome to be executed. Some went to Iran, Afghanistan, Africa, Asia. They went everywhere, all over the place. And so we all, every single one of us who call ourselves followers of Christ, must can seriously consider whether God has called us to pursue missions worldwide, to go and share the gospel around the world. And that's actually exactly why we're doing this trip to Greece, because we want to see people around the world come to know Jesus. But I also don't want you to miss the importance of what Jesus is talking about in verse 8. The target is everywhere, the whole world, including what's close to you. So what neighbors could you pursue to tell them about Jesus? What family members do you know that need to hear this beautiful gospel message? What friends do you have at school that need to hear about this? And we need to remember that the Christian life is not meant to make us comfortable, but to make us a messenger of God's great grace wherever we go. So what will we do now with the grace that has been given to us? And that this Holy Spirit empowerment, what are we going to do with that gift as well? Last section, verse 9. After he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And so after Jesus gave the charge to be witnesses around the world, he was taken before their eyes. And this is very reminiscent of these stories in the Old Testament, where in Genesis, you hear about this man named Enoch. It says he was simply not, that he was taken up into heaven before he even died. Or you look in the book of Kings, you hear about this man, this prophet, Elijah, who his successor, Elisha, watches him be taken up into a cloud up into heaven without dying. So it's reminiscent of a, of a righteous man who was taken out, taken up into heaven without dying. But that Jesus is taken up in this cloud, it's also reminiscent of God's holy presence, God's cloud, it's this, the God's glory that dwelled among the nation of Israel, that indwelled within the temple in Jerusalem, that God had taken up residence among his people. And so if there was any confusion still to this point, this should be the final conclusion that the apostles would look up and go, yeah, that guy was God. Because look at what just happened. Look at how this went. But it says, this is kind of an interesting thing, that they were, they were looking intently up into the sky, almost as if they went, okay, the last 40 days he's been, you know, popping in and popping out, popping in, popping out. He's just going to do it again. We're just going to wait. We're just going to stand here. He's going to come back again, right? And then these two angels come in and they say, mm, nope. But he will come back, just not right now. Just not anytime soon. And he says, in the same way that he just left, he is going to come back again. He's going to come back. He left in power and glory. He is also going to return in power and glory as well. And so what's crazy about this passage is that it, give, it should give us great hope that Jesus is going to return someday. They're, the angels are telling the apostles, he's going to come back. He is, he's going to come back. Don't fear. So we have to ask the question, why did Jesus, why didn't he just stay? Why did he have to leave? Remember what he said earlier, so that the Holy Spirit would come and dwell within each and every one of us. This was not something Jesus was called to do. It was the Holy Spirit's job to come and dwell within us. And so what's implied within this verse is, look, he, you've got a mission to do. Don't just stare up into the sky waiting for Jesus to return. You have a job to do. And so this leads us to our fourth and final objective, that we continue this mission until Jesus returns. Again, many have vainly tried to predict when Jesus will return. And I remember earlier, Jesus makes it very clear, it's not for you to know. And that's because we need to be urgent, recognizing we don't and can't know the timing of Christ's return. So our response instead is to continue the mission Jesus laid out in front of us until that day that he returns. And it seems very likely if you look into the accounts of the New Testament that the disciples and apostles and the following disciples after them, that they believed that, the, that Jesus would return within their lifetime. And here we are, 2,000 years later, he still has not returned. 
And so we are still, the task is still put in front of us. But unfortunately, I think here in America, many Christians have twisted the idea of Christianity to be about us feeling better about ourselves, bringing us comfort, when the truth is that it is about us being radically saved by God's grace to then go on mission for Jesus around the world. So I want to close by looking at this at one more verse. This is Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So in other words, think about this. The end is going to come when the gospel has reached all nations. And so that word nations, you can translate it as people groups. So let me explain what we mean by what that means people groups. So I went to India uh, many years ago, and there's about a billion people there. There's a lot of people, and it was really crowded. And we went and visited this people group called the Yanadis. They have their own, they have their own language. They have their own set of cultural understandings. And so, within India, there are all kinds of people groups. So you can't just say the people of India. You can't say nations because there's only about 196 nations. You have to think about how many, you know, the, of the people groups. And so here, when they've done this study, they've looked at it. There are 11,000 people groups in the world. 11,000. That's a lot. And that, that's a pretty, pretty much a guess. And so then they categorize some people groups as unreached. And that means that less than 2% of those people are evangelical Christians. So I want you to make a guess in your head. How many of those people, those people groups of the 11,000 are unreached? 6,000. The vast majority of people groups in our world are still considered unreached and have not heard the gospel message. What should, this should do for us is this should lead us to realize that the mission is far from over. Our job is still there to go and share the gospel around the world to whoever we possibly can because we need them. They need to hear the gospel. They need to hear the saving message of the kingdom. But also don't forget, your neighborhood is unreached in many ways. Your school that you go to is unreached. Your workplace may be unreached. And so the mission is laid out in front of you. The power has been given to you to accomplish it. What are you going to do now? Because Christ has not, saved us, has not saved us just for ourselves, but for us to join him in his radical rescue mission of the world. And so we need to remind ourselves that our radical mission as followers of Christ is to make disciples of all nations, and we are empowered by God's spirit to accomplish it. Let's pray. God, thank you that you have given us your spirit to accomplish this mission, that Jesus, you have not left us to figure this out on our own, that Jesus, you are with us, you will empower us and enable us, but Jesus, help us to recognize the importance and urgency to go and share the gospel message and to make disciples. So God, if there is anything that we have not yet been discipled in, God, help us to find somebody who can disciple us to show us where to go and what to do. But God, overall, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.